Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. The topic today is outrage. An outrage perpetrated against every citizen of New York State by New York State for 45 years. New York refuses to reveal the names of the killers of 39 men in a cold-blooded massacre in 1971 in a place called Attica. It was a disaster, but it was how the state chose to regain control of a prison seized by inmates who, quote, had simply had enough of being treated as less than human. That quote comes from a remarkable new book entitled Blood in the Water, The Attica Prison Uprising of 1971 and Its Legacy. Its author is Heather Ann Thompson, award-winning historian at the University of Michigan, and you will meet her next. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program the author of this tremendous book, uh, Blood in the Water, Dr. Heather Ann Thompson. Welcome. It's great to be here. This is um, extraordinary on many levels, but one of them is that the themes that it um, covers, racial issues, uh, criminal justice issues, police brutality issues, that all of this is in the background. and. 1971 and, and even now. No, it seems like nothing has changed. Well, that's right. I mean, I had certainly uh, not planned uh, when I was writing the book for it to be so timely, but there's no question that all of the same issues that this book raises about uh, equal justice under the law and accountability and uh, police interactions with black citizens, all of these are uh, as much a part of the book uh, then as they are uh, very much part of the news today. Unfortunately, right. unfortunately. Let's, let's set the stage quickly about uh, the prison, the uprising, and then we'll come back to these issues and, and what it all means for today. Mm -hmm. The stage is Attica was, is, is or was a high security prison, but it was a hellhole. There was brutal, sadistic treatment that was sort of quotidian. Mm -hmm. uh, the inmates, 1,300 of them, petitioned for decent, decency. They, those petitions were ignored. The inmates almost accidentally took control, as wasn't pre-planned. There was brief violence when they took control, then they restored order. Four days of negotiations with the state, fruitless, and then the massacre. Um, briefly, and we'll come back to it, describe that massacre. Well, so after four days, uh, with 1,300 men who had been negotiating with the state, uh, with observers on hand to facilitate those negotiations, with hostages in the yard to help uh, uh, motivate the state to uh, negotiate, hostages, by the way, who were being protected and who very much supported that these negotiations would go forward. Hostages, by the way, being the, the, the uh, correction officers. officers. Yeah. Um, and on the fifth day, the governor of New York made the decision to send in uh, more than 500 very heavily armed state troopers who had been amassing outside of the prison and uh, to retake the prison by force, even though everyone on site was, re was essentially telling him it would be a massacre if he did. And he did anyway. And, and they indeed, came in firing indiscriminately at everything right. that moved. Uh, we'll come back to that. There are thousands of boxes of documents about this that New York still refuses to reveal. What's in those documents? Why will they not, why will the state not reveal? Well, I mean, it's difficult for me to say uh, exactly why. It is certainly the case that um, the public has a right to see these documents. Uh, Attica is a public institution. Uh, the state of New York, anything that happened there should be in the public domain. But uh, there were 29 uh, prisoners, 10 hostages who were killed by law enforcement bullets on the day of the retaking, 128 men very severely shot, uh, torture that goes on for days and weeks after the retaking. Mm -hmm. And so there are many people, I feel strongly that the state of New York has tried to protect uh, primarily members of law enforcement. And so to reveal those records uh, potentially uh, exposes uh, people to prosecution. Uh, of and course. I think that is the issue. Well, we should, it, it's, it's appropriate to, to mention here that uh, 
after all of this, New York State uh, has never apologized, right. has never prosecuted, has never tried to prosecute anyone for any crime except prisoners. Right. Uh, state troopers and sheriff's deputies and others who came in and, and took right. it over, never been um, prosecuted or attempted to be prosecuted, never been even named. Mm -hmm. You made news with the book and actually named some people for the first time. What kind of reaction did you get from the state, if any, from the people, mm -hmm. <laughs> if any? Well, I mean, I, I, I should back up and say that the reason why my book was able to uh, finally reveal who the state investigators believed had uh, committed crimes at Attica, um, either prisoners or uh, members of law enforcement, was by happenstance. I happened upon um, a, a stash of records that undoubtedly I was not supposed to see. That's what allowed me to tell the history of the state's investigation, and part of telling that history was to tell the readers who the state believed had done what. Uh, and so mm -hmm. names were mentioned in my book, um, but uh, it, it is interesting. I, I have taken some criticism for naming members of law enforcement whom the state had evidence against. Um, but of course, I'm a historian, and, uh, and it was my job to, to tell that history as it was, not as uh, people would have hoped it would have been. Let's uh, briefly recap the conditions that, that led to this. Attica, by the way, uh, even though it was a high security prison, the prisoners there were, were thieves and drug dealers by and large. We're not talking about, I mean, we're talking about, in some cases, violent men. We're not talking about the best people in the world, but we're also not talking about horrendous murderers and, and the worst kinds of criminals that you could, by and large, that you can have. Anyway, listen to this and, and, and hold on to your chair. Here are the conditions at Attica in 1971. Each prisoner was allowed one bar of soap and one roll of toilet paper per month. Each prisoner was allowed one shower a week. Broken bones, when they had them, weren't treated. Teeth were lost for want of adequate medical care. Uh, there was regular strip searching of the prisoners. There was not enough food, and the food that they were served wasn't the healthiest it could could be. If you were a Hispanic prisoner, you suffered even more because any mail that came to you was just routinely thrown away because the guards couldn't read Spanish and didn't want to bother trying to find out what was in those letters. And so they petitioned. They say, please, this is not, this is inhumane. And nothing happens. Well, that's right. And I think that the book uh, will surprise readers, as you say, that the people we're talking about are, um, there's, there's, there's parole violators in here, um, young people, 18-year-olds, 21-year-olds. Um, there are people there because they were drug addicts, not because they were hardened mm -hmm. criminals. And these people had been sentenced to time, but they had not been sentenced to abuse or neglect uh, or lack of food or lack of basic medical care. So they tried to get this remedied through the system. They were largely ignored. Um, and so when they have this opportunity to speak out publicly, uh, in a rather fluke situation where they get to uh, take control of the prison, they invite the media in. They, they want the world mm -hmm. to see what, of course, we never get to see, even though prisons are public institutions, which is what, what is really happening behind bars. And, um, and in that process to, to demand, again, very, very basic human rights things, um, sufficient food, uh, a, a right to see the mail of their loved ones, you know, things that are quite mm -hmm. basic. Um, and, and, and that is one of the reasons why, of course, there was so much attention on this. The media was there, the, the television cameras were rolling, and, um, and it had the possibility of being a game changer, that, that prisons could have been reformed and things could have negotiated, a, peace, a peaceful settlement could have been mm -hmm. negotiated. This is among the things that made me so angry reading your book, and, and I say that with, with the highest praise. I mean, how difficult is it to give prisoners more soap, more toilet paper, uh, uh, more than one shower a week? What? And, and, and New York State's uh, Commissioner of Corrections then was, was known as a reformer, Oswald, Russell Oswald. Uh, do you, even with, with, the, with the intensive history that you, you, 10 years you spent on this, yeah. do you un can you understand what 
I, some some of this was simple. Why couldn't it get well, done? I, I think to understand it, you have to get you you have to uh, zoom out a bit and put this in the context of the civil rights movement of the time. The fact that the president of the United States was Nixon, who was deeply deeply suspicious of the civil rights movement, and particularly if it was going to start erupting in prisons. Well, they good point that you make because they, they, there's there's reporting that. Nixon, the Nixon White House was paying very close attention That's to right. this and th saw it through a lens of some sort of urban or, or national insurgency was underway. Right. And there's a quote from the Nixon tapes mm -hmm. that have been released over the years. This is the president of the United States talking about uh, Attica to whoever's in the Oval Office saying, you see, it is black business. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right. So, so from the Nixon White House's point of view, this is a rebellion that needs to be shut down. And from Nelson Rockefeller's point of view, he's known as a moderate Republican, but the Republican Party was moving very much rightward, uh, becoming a law and order party. And in, in key respects, Rockefeller sees Attica as the line in the sand. He's going to show he's tough on these prisoners, these criminals in his view. And what was going to happen is that he will protect his own retaking. And that is to say all the terrible things that went down that day, he will go to great lengths to make sure uh, that no one in law enforcement, no one in his administration is held accountable for it. Um, and, and that really does amount to a cover up, I think, as the book shows, secret meetings, uh, splicing film, destroying uh, photographs. Um, well, he tried to sell the story to the public initially that the uh, hostages who were killed uh, were killed by the prisoners having cut their throats well, that's right. brutally. And this is a critically important lie because even though uh, within 15 minutes it's a bloodbath inside of Attica, all due to law enforcement bullets, the state of New York goes out in front of the prison, tells the world, because remember that the media is assembled sure. there, that the prisoners have not only killed the hostages by slashing their throats, but they've actually castrated one of the hostages. And this lie goes out over the AP, front page of the New York Times, front page of the LA Times. And my book really suggests that this is a pivotal turning point in American history where a nation that was sympathetic to prison reform arguments and sympathetic to this idea that prisoners should be treated as human uh, really sours on this idea and, and, and grows increasingly punitive. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we end up, as we do today, with mass incarceration, uh, this idea that we need to solve mm -hmm. all social problems by locking people up. Well, uh, in conjunction with the story, the, the lies that the governor uh, tried to sell about what happened here is the... Uh, as you point out, the heroism, I guess you'd call it, of the, of the medical examiners who examined the 39 bodies and were being pressured to re have their report That's right. agree with the official uh, uh, version of things, and they and they wouldn't do it. Well, that's right. So the so the the book is on the one hand, as you say, infuriating. It's about everybody with power doing all the wrong things uh, uh, and, and really, um, really committing terrible human rights abuses. But on the other hand, it is a story of uh, incredible heroism on the part of certain people like the medical examiner who refused to say that the prisoners had killed the hostages when they hadn't. Um, uh, people inside of the state government who refused to allow the police to be protected and tried to get the investigation to be more even handed. So there are some people, and of course the prisoners themselves, who despite all odds uh, refuse to go away. They continue to tell their stories. The hostages whom uh, the state had also treated terribly after their own state employees. Not only did they shoot some of them, but they then swindled them out of yeah. their workman's compensation. So those people never went away. And so the story is both about um, you know terrible deeds, but it's also the story about uh, a real David and Goliath story of people refusing to uh, give up and go away. What the medical examiner's people uh, said officially was, Everyone was killed by bullets, That's right. and only the state troopers and the others who took the prison had, had, guns. had guns. Had guns. That's the right. prisoners had no guns. Um, we've talked about the crimes of the retaking, and then afterwards, you, you alluded to it a moment ago, there were sadistic mm -hmm. uh, uh, crimes uh, on the day after, the, day, the rest of the day of, of, of the retaking. 
and, and going forward by the correction officers against the prisoners. I mean, torture, mm -hmm. uh, forcing prisoners to drink their urine, mm -hmm. uh, uh, forcing them to play Russian roulette. I mean, there were at least, it seems, one or two murders. I, I, nothing. We have nothing. Right. We have no, no attempt to... Well, and we don't very deliberately. Um, you, you're absolutely right. Terrible uh, torture goes on. One uh, judge will later refer to it as an orgy of brutality. Um, and, and those men were completely at the mercy of the corrections officers and state troopers at that point. They were stripped naked. They were tortured for days, weeks, and months. And, and the reason why that is allowed to happen, again, is that the prison was then shut down. No one could get inside. Uh, and, and the the offenders, the people who, who did it, were being protected. So there yeah. was no evidence trail, or at least until uh, I showed that there was, and the state had actually made a conscious effort not to prosecute them. Have you tried to communicate with the current administration, the, the Cuomo administration, and find out what they, are they thinking about this at all? And, well, I think, I mean, I think that there's a possibility that we could open the records now. I know that in response to the book uh, and certainly in response to the uh, hostage survivors pressuring uh, the current administration, there is some talk of opening the records. Indeed, there's a website now, uh, the State Ar Archives, where you could search for some Attica records. Um, I have to admit I'm skeptical of how far that mm -hmm. opening will go. I know that as we speak that I have had... Um, Freedom of Information request still denied um, on the basis of saying that I was asking for grand jury testimony, which I was not. Um, so I, I think that there's still a lot to be protected. I don't believe that there would be prosecutions, but I do think that for the state of New York to admit this level of, of trauma that was down to its own members of law enforcement is a very controversial story today. I know and, maybe, that and maybe to prosecute some criminals, uh, some of whom apparently are murderers. Well, I think it's it's always possible that there would be prosecutions, but notably the survivors are not interested in prosecutions. The survivors simply want the records open. They want to know what happened to their loved ones. They want to come to terms with it. Um, yeah. This event traumatized families and individuals for four decades and still traumatizes them. So this book is really an attempt to both tell their story, but also to let New York and the nation understand um, why Attica um, comes to mean the worst of the worst uh, in, in our in our sort of lexicon rather than uh, one of the most important struggles for human rights. And that's because in many ways we lost that story in that 1971 moment when the state got allowed, uh, was allowed to tell it uh, exclusively. Right. And you, you referred to the state abuse of its own people after right. the fact in terms of the people trying to get compensation. The second half of your book is pretty much all about the fights for uh, compensation on the part of, of survivors and, mm -hmm. and relatives, and uh, it's a long and ugly story. That's um, right. Uh, and they were, as you point out, they were many of them were forced to take ridiculous. You were, f were forced into taking ridiculous settlements and mm -hmm. and and um, by the state. Anyway, we talk about we've we've hit on the racial uh, underpinning. Let me go to a couple of quotes and the the um, about the racial. Uh, nature of this, underpinning this. Uh, and before I do, the, there was a special commission on Attica in 1972. Yeah. Yeah. And the finding of that special commission said this, the that, that Attica uprising and retaking was the bloodiest encounter between Americans since the Civil War. But on the, by the issue of, of race, we have one of the observers, Tom Wicker, the, the, the notable former New York Times columnist, who was, as I said, one of the observers, he wrote a book about this years ago and, and came up with this conclusion. The heart of the matter, wrote Tom Wicker, was fear of blackness. We have Nixon in the White House talking about this is black business. There's an FBI memo uh, that circulates within the department uh, because they're worried that New York State is uh, being too lenient on the prisoners. And the memo says, the FBI memo says, New York State capitulated to unreasonable demands of prisoners, most of whom are black. Uh, 
That is the crux of it. I mean, yeah. Tom Wicker was absolutely right. When you actually read the book and see uh, the retaking in blow-by-blow uh, blow detail, you understand how racialized it was. These were men being forced to give the white power salute. These are men who were, every racial epithet was coming their way while they were being beaten or shot. The, the white prisoners, because there were many white prisoners in Attica who stood with the black and Puerto Rican prisoners, and they too were reviled by members of law enforcement for having stood with the black and brown prisoners. So it was fundamentally, you can't understand the brutality without understanding that this was about race, um, but it was also about uh, a fear of the rebellion itself, a fear of politics, that somehow uh, the, 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 the country was coming apart at the seams, all of these demands for equal rights, all of these demands to be treated as equal and human coming both from city streets you know, Harlem erupting in 64, uh, Philadelphia, Detroit in 67. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a moment uh, where citizens tried to affect real equality uh, through the system, and when that was not effective, then in the streets or by erupting in prisons. And the administration was very clear that by the time we get to Attica, that they're going to shut it down. And they did, and it was very brutal. What is... Um Unpleasant, at least, and, and disturbing, is that is the question of how much, if anything, has changed. Mm -hmm. The New York Times did a, a, an extensive investigation two years ago of New York prisons, New York State prisons, and found pervasive brutality and corruption still existing, guards regularly beating prisoners, uh, their actions being covered up officially, never or rarely punished. Does that leave you hope? I know it doesn't yeah. leave you hopeless, but, but why not? Well, I think that that's one of the most disturbing parts about uh, the end of the book, which is that you realize that in some key respects, things are much worse now than they were in 71. Um, New York prisons improve uh, in very important ways after Attica because of Attica, but nationally, uh, the, the backlash is severe, and even in New York, at places like Attica in particular, uh, the abuses don't go away, they do get worse. And today we have, uh, uh, you know, Attica remains a trauma site. Attica remains a place where there's too much guard abuse, uh, there's too much cover up still about what's going on. And, and for that reason, um, you know, I think the book has been an opportunity to really ask that question, why are these institutions so closed from the public? Um, their job is to do uh, containment of people after sentencing. Um, but presumably that doesn't need to happen in the dark or in secret. And, uh, and I think that this book has raised questions again about what's happening in Attica. And we should make it clear that the things that are happening today, very much like the things that happened uh, 45 years ago, are, not, are in no way confined to New York State and the New York State prison system. I mean, I've read about abuses in Florida and mm -hmm. other states, and I'm sure you have too. So is there any uh, hope for prison reform on, on, on any level? Well, I think so, and I think that the reason is that um, the book ultimately concludes that when you put this many people in one place and treat them as less than human, invariably and inevitably they will stand together and they will resist, they will speak up, they will speak out. And indeed, we are seeing that again. Um, in September of this year, uh, on September 9th, the anniversary of the Attica uprising, uh, prisoners across this nation again uh, initiated a series of protests on very, very similar grounds. And uh, the question is what will happen? And I think in part what will happen will depend upon the public and the public's determination to uh, to run humane institutions so that the people, when they leave them, uh, are, are going to return home whole, um, regardless of uh, what the sentence was and regardless of what their initial wrongdoing was. Once they've paid a debt, um, to, to treat them as humans so that they can return home whole. I think what will happen next will depend on the American public, ironically, um, even less so than politicians, because politicians will do ultimately what the public demands that they do. And I'm glad you're hopeful, but I wonder about the politics of this. It doesn't seem that prisoners in, in the prison system mm -hmm. is uh, something that's on the front burner of Have many 
of any many politicians. They, do, right. they, they don't vote. Well, that's people. true. And indeed, one of the reasons they don't vote <laughs> is actually part of policy as well, precisely so that they don't have a voice. That's but, another book. But I, but I will say it's interesting. I think that this was, uh, this was true for many decades that prisoners had less of a voice. But now we're in a crisis situation. We have still two million people that are locked up. We have seven and a half million uh, in correctional control. And you know, more than 65 million Americans with a criminal record right now. So now we're talking about the fact that this is a much bigger percentage of our population. These are people who do come home and the voting population is related to these people actually. And, and sure. these people are our mothers and our brothers and our sisters and our, you know, fathers. And so it, it, I think it is true that when you have that many people behind bars in this country, more than any other country on the planet, we do have an opportunity to revisit this policy, and, and, and I hope that the, the book will give us at least the chance to talk about it. There are many uh, experts in the field of, of criminal justice and, and related fields, and then there are just people, uh, ordinary citizens, uh, who think that mass incarceration, as you pointed out in this country, it's, it, we, we have more prison, mm -hmm. uh, more people in prison and, and under uh, criminal justice control than any nation in the world. That mass incarceration is the moral scandal of this mm -hmm. country. And indeed it is. Um, as a historian, I think I, I, I can say with absolute certainty that we chose uh, a very punitive criminal justice policy at a moment when crime was not particularly historically remarkable. We began a war on crime for political reasons, not safety reasons. And we created a system that we can't afford, that has terrible human rights abuses in it. And indeed, it is the civil rights crisis of the 21st century. And for all of those reasons, I do think that there is some bipartisan support now uh, to reform the system. But ultimately, uh, we can't reform it. We won't have the will to reform it until we understand that these are people inside of it. Um, who experienced the things that these same guys did in Attica back in 1971. And that's why history matters, so that we can, um, we can learn from it and presumably uh, not do it again uh, and, and improve upon it. So We have a new president. His name is Trump. Um, one does not see in his profile the kind of person who would be interested in this issue, in, in, in improving things. Right. Right? Do you see something that... I don't see. Well, again, I, I think that, you know, the, the shocking result that he is now the president um, throws questions in the air about we were, in fact, uh, having some momentum with criminal justice reform and whether we maintain that remains to be seen. But again, I, I want to just stress that regardless of what Trump may want um, or the, the new Senate and the, and the new House, I think we need to re remember that uh, prisons are public institutions um, that house all of our family members. Um, and most of people inside are not just offenders, but they are also victims mm -hmm. of crimes themselves. And so we have, to, we have to demand that our politicians, no matter who's in the White House, uh, walk this back. We can't afford it on moral reasons and we can't afford it on uh, economic grounds as well. Just before we leave, uh, give me the demographics, if you can, of those two million in prison. Well, it's overwhelmingly poor people first. It's, it's overwhelmingly black and brown people. And um, it's overwhelmingly uh, people in the poorest, both rural and urban neighborhoods. And so uh, the most marginalized citizens, the people who we could be responding to with social uh, programs, we are responding to through criminal justice programs. And, and, and we've made a wrong turn. We have, to, we have to reassess drug addiction, for example, not as a criminal health problem, but as a public health problem and, mm. and so forth. And, and I, think that, uh, I think Americans are very aware that we can't sustain uh, this punitive approach. The book is Blood in the Water by our guest, Dr. Heather Ann Thompson, historian at the University of Michigan. It is refreshing and interesting and, and compelling to listen to you and, and to read this book. And thank you for being here. Thank you. We'll see you next time.